Listo. Muy buenos, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, estimado doctor Miguel Tufiño Velázquez, director de la Escuela Superior de Física y Matemáticas del Instituto Politécnico Nacional. Estimado doctor John Nildo, conferencista invitado. Estimado doctor Luis Manuel Tobar Sánchez. Estimada doctora Araceli Medina Bonifán, eh, conferencista invitada a la reunión. A, estimado comité organizador, participantes y asistentes en general de la Reunión Nacional Académica de Física y Matemáticas. Es para, es para mí, eh, pues para un servidor, brindarles la bienvenida a las actividades de esta edición 26 de la Reunión Nacional Académica de Física y Matemáticas, la cual está enmarcada en el 60 aniversario de la Escuela Superior de Física y Matemáticas del Instituto Politécnico Nacional. Para dar inicio con la sesión, cederé la palabra al doctor Miguel Tufiño Velázquez, director de la escuela, quien dirigirá las palabras inaugurales de la sesión. Muchas gracias, Erika. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a esta reunión nacional académica de física y matemáticas en su vigésima sexta edición. Es un gusto para nosotros eh, poder eh, presentar en esta ocasión a una de las eh, de los personajes, yo diría de las leyendas de la, de la matemática más importantes en los últimos años. Eh, en esta ocasión, nuestra Reunión Nacional Académica de Física y Matemáticas se engalana con la participación del profesor John Milner de la Universidad de Stony Brook en Nueva York. La verdad eh, es un honor tener a, a una persona tan distinguida y tan importante. Y bueno, pues tenía que ser así porque pues este, esta vigésima sexta reunión nacional académica de física y matemáticas se enmarca en, en, las, eh, en los festejos del 60 aniversario de la fundación de la Escuela Superior de Física y Matemáticas. Entonces, para nosotros es un gusto, eh, digamos, tener a personas tan importantes como el profesor John Milner y a la doctora Araceli Medina Bonifant, eh, quien es egresada de nuestra escuela y quien es la única mujer mexicana eh, que publica o que ha publicado con un eh, investigador que, que ha sido eh, galardonado con la medalla Fields. Y bueno, pues la verdad es que es un, es un, eh, es un eh, honor y la verdad es que es, es un gusto, nos da mucho gusto tener eh, egresados tan distinguidos de nuestra querida escuela. Por consiguiente, pues eh, siendo las 12 horas con 33 minutos de este, de este día 25 de agosto del año 2021, declaro formalmente inaugurados los trabajos de esta vigésima sexta Reunión Nacional Académica de Física y Matemáticas. Voy a permitirme dar la bienvenida al profesor John Milner y después cederé la palabra al, al doctor Luis Manuel Tobar para que haga la presenta, haga su, lea su eh, ficha biográfica. Profesor John Milner. It's an honor, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. We want to thank you for accepting to give this talk. It's, uh, for, it's for us very important that uh, a, people, a person like you give a talk in this uh, event in which we are commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Physics and Mathematics Faculty of the National Polytechnic Institute. So we are very pleased and we thank you a lot for participating in our event. And uh, uh, we want to welcome you. And I'm going to give uh, the word to Dr. Luis Manuel Tobar. He's going to read your uh, biographical sketch. And after that, you will, may, you, will, you will be able to begin your talk. Please, Luis Manuel, uh, we give the welcome to Professor uh, Milner and read his biographical sketch. Thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome, Professor Milner. First, I will read your biographical sketch in Spanish for the audience, and then I will make the presentation of your talk in English. El profesor John Milner es una figura legendaria de las matemáticas. Él ha trabajado y publicado libros y un gran número de artículos de investigación en topología algebraica, topología diferencial, geometría diferencial, álgebra, teoría de singularidades 
y más recientemente en sistemas dinámicos. De hecho, la plática del día de hoy es sobre esta área. El profesor Miguel es profesor investigador y codirector del Instituto de Matemáticas de la Universidad Stony Brook en Nueva York. Todos sabemos que las máximas preseas que se otorgan en el mundo de las matemáticas son la medalla Fields y el premio Abel. Pocos son los afortunados en llegar a recibir tales preseas, y menos aún los que han recibido ambas, tan solo cinco en la historia. El profesor John Milner es uno de ellos. El título de su plática es Mapeos Polinomiales Cúbicos, los cuales originalmente fueron introducidos y estudiados por Brian Branner y Hubert en 1988, pero que después de más de 30 años siguen teniendo problemas interesantísimos aún no resueltos. La plática de hoy es un trabajo conjunto con Araceli Medina Bonifant. So now, it's my pleasure to present Professor John Milner with the talk, Cubic Polynomial Maps. Please, Professor Milner. Thank you. Stuck. Well, I seem to be <clears throat> having trouble with my getting started, but it's it's a great pleasure to be in Mexico, at least by computer. And it's wonderful to see people. The talk I want to give. Let's see what we can do. Just go ahead and keep talking. Okay. <laughs> The talk I want to give is about cubic polynomials, but I will first start by talking a little bit about quadratic polynomials. There are two reasons for this. First of all, the theory of quadratic polynomials provides a, a model for understanding it's just dead. Polynomials of any degree. Sorry. Jack. And second, uh, when we study cubic polynomials, we often find remnants, reminders of quadratic polynomials in cubic Julia sets. We often find copies of quadratic Julia sets in parameter space for cubic polynomials. We often find copies of the Mandelbrot set, the parameter space for quadratic polynomials. Okay. Ah, there. <laughs> so, so the Dyna such dyna dynamics of polynomials has been studied for more than 100 years, so I can't give references for all of the things I will, the facts I will quote. There are, many of them are quite old, some are more recent. So in degree two, every polynomial can put into a, into a standard form, normal form z maps to z squared plus c. To put it in this form, we just need to make a complex change of variable, an affine change of variable. And the map is then characterized by a single complex number. But thus the parameter space consisting of all such maps can be identified with the complex plane, which is easy to visualize. So at this point, I want to, uh, to switch to, let's see where we are. So, I 
Missy sharing. So is it is it is it on the screen now? Yeah. So the, this this I'm using the program Dynamics Explorer, written by Suzanne and Brian Boyd, which is a convenient way of uh, tying up the the uh, illustrating the dynamics. So here we see the most classical picture, the Mandelbrot set, which is the set of well, this entire plane represents the, this complex plane. We're looking at parameters of the form f of z is equals z squared plus c, and this is the c plane. So for the black region, the Mandelbrot set, this office is this uh, or, orbits of the, of the one critical point are bounded. So, so let's see, let's... Uh, So if I if I point in the middle of the Mandelbrot set, we get kind of a featureless thing. The the Phil Julia set, the set points with bounded orbit, is a, is a rather jagged, bounded by a rather jagged simple closed curve. Now. Sorry. I, Okay, so so for example, if we click in this little knob on the top, we get what is called the Duadi rabbit. It has a Julia set with uh, a critical period three orbit. So if we trace, The orbit stays starting at the critical point. We get an orbit which bounces around like this. And if you start somewhere out here, we'll, this is a pre an image of pre image, so it will eventually get to there. It bounces around if it finally ends up circling around the critical point. But if we go, this, so this green is the filled Julia set, the set of points with bounded orbit. If we click anywhere outside of this, say just here, then the orbit will bounce around and eventually shoot off to infinity. Or if we click farther out, it will shoot off right away to infinity. And we get similar things for other points. So suppose I click here. This is, so this is the points are organized by period. This is period a quarter, one third. This is, I think, three fifths, and this is a half. If I click there, we got a thing which is popularly known as the basilica. And I can similarly trace the orbits here. So if I start at the critical point, then it will bounce back and forth. But if we start somewhere else like here, we will eventually, in the green, we will eventually get, orbit will bounce around a bit, but eventually get there. But if we start anywhere outside the green, then the orbit will eventually shoot off to infinity. Let's see, perhaps I'll just take one more example. The Mandelbrot set uh, seems to finish here, if you, unless you look closely. But um, let's see if we yeah. zoom in. If we uh, blow up this region, then we see that there are other copies of the Mandelbrot set out here. And for example, this is the biggest one. If we click here with uh, we get a figure which is popularly known as the airplane. 
which has a period three orbit. So if I click on the critical point again, then, well, it's rather hard to see what's happening because the orbit shoots back and forth between this point, this point, and this point, or I'm sorry. Anyway, it shoots around in a period three orbit. I guess we'll see it better if I click slightly off center. So we'll see it first goes way out here and then over here and then back here. Okay, I think that's enough for, for this. Now, I want to pass on to cubic polynomial maps. So, I, what did you do? There. Okay. Now, uh, Okay. Yeah. Okay. For the cubic case, oh, we can put a polynomial in this normal form z cubed plus a times z plus b. And, the, and we now need two complex constants, which means that. Uh, which means that uh, the analog of the Mandelbrot set now, the, now lies in a space of re, re, four real dimensions. So this is four dimensions is pretty hard to visualize. It's, and it's easy to get lost if you're trying to find out what's happening. Okay, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Okay, so, the, the 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 way I'll get around this is to uh, I'm sorry. pass to a one one complex dimensional subspace. I'm perfectly happy with it. Okay, Spanish, well, keep so, up with the Spanish. I'll see yeah. if I can find the English. Yeah. So the um, there we go. Sorry, why won't it go? Where are you? <laughs> okay, so that uh, so I want to pass to a complex one-dimensional subspace, and the way we do this is we'll first remember that that uh, look at the critical points. A cubic map has two critical points, ones where the derivative is, is zero. Oh, one special case is the two, one special case the two points come together, but in general there are two distinct critical points. And what we'll do is mark these points and require that one of them, the first critical point, be periodic with, with some fixed period. So in this way, we obtain what I call a space SP, the parameter space. So for any integer P, one or more, the space SP is the set of all conscious feature classes of cubic polynomial maps with a marked critical point A, which has period P under iteration. So that means if we set Z0 equals A and let Z0 map to Z1, map to Z2, and so on up to Zp, then Z0 and Zp are the same. They're the critical point A, but all of the ones in between are different from A. So takes p steps, p iterates to get back to where we started. And the set of all polynomials, which in some suitable normal form, which uh, behave like this is called the curve SP. And the basic theorem is that if we choose coordinates very carefully, then 
sp can be given the structure of a smooth algebraic curve in the space of two complex variables. Now, for many years, it's been an unsolved problem as to whether this curve is always connected, but this has recently been solved by, by Mathieu Arfeu and Jan Kiwi, Jan Kiwi in Chile, have proved that the curve is always connected for every p. Or in other words, if we think of it as, as an algebraic variety, it's a, an irreducible com complex variety. Now, so for each p, we have a, a Riemann surface that we can study. But there's a problem. The genus grows very rapidly with p. So for p equals one or two, for period one or two, we got a curve of genus zero. That's just a Riemann sphere. But for curve of genus three, we have a genus one. For period three, we have genus one, which is a torus. And then it goes up very rapidly. And these are not closed Riemann surfaces. They're, each one has punctures. So for period one, we just got the Riemann sphere with one point at infinity. And if we remove that, we get the complex plane. But for period two, there are two punctures. Period three, there are eight. And this also grows very rapidly. SP is a very complicated object when P is greater than three. But so it's, for example, if, if we want, want to look at S6, it's very hard to visualize the surface of genus three, 393. It's, it's a horribly complicated object. But fortunately for, if we just look at things locally, if we look at any one small piece of this parameter space, then we get something which looks just like a small open set in C and we can make pictures and understand. So we can hope to understand things locally. It's more difficult to understand things on the entire surface all at once. So each point in SP corresponds to a cubic map, which we can study. So I need some basic definitions. For any polynomial map, the filled Julia set is the compact set consisting of all points which have bounded orbit under iteration. It's easy to make rough picture, at least rough pictures of this filled Julia set. Just pick it if we give any point, we, and we can start iterating f many times. And if we're not in the Julia set, then uh, not in the filled Julia set, then eventually we'll shoot off towards infinity. So, for example, if you just iterate 100 times, uh, if the, uh, well, 100 and the 10 are rather random numbers here, but wouldn't, nothing much would change if we changed 100 to 1,000 or if we changed 10 to 5. But, but, uh, when we iterate many times and it doesn't shoot off to infinity, then either we're in the filled Julia set or we must be very, very close to it. Now we have the basic theorem, which goes back to the beginnings of the theory 100 years ago. The set K of F is connected if and only if it contains all of the critical points of F. And there is an analog in, in parameter space, an analog of the, of the Mandelbrot set. That is, in the para corresponding parameter space, you look at the family of F for which K of F is connected. This is called the connectedness locus. And again, it's easy to make pictures. For example, in our space, we're looking at a cubic map with two critical points. One of them is periodic, so it can never escape to infinity. We just have to follow the other orbit of the other, other critical point, for say 100 times. And if, if it hasn't escaped, gone far away in 100 iterates, then it's either in the connectedness locus or very close to it.
Well, so the first basic theorem is that the connectedness locus is always a compact connected set. Here we're using the fact that SP is connected. On the other hand, each puncture point, that's a, something like the point, that's the point where the polynomial coefficients of the polynomial blown up. So it orbits are shooting off to infinity in a neighborhood. Each puncture point is surrounded by an escape region. This is an open set, which is conformally diffeomorphic to the complement of the closed unit disk in C. And these two together give you everything. So, so the complement of the connectedness locus is the disjoint union of these open sets. Okay, let me again go to Dynamics Explorer. No, he has to share. Okay. You have to share your screen. So. How, how do I do that? Okay. Yeah, let me go. Let me get these guys, right? Okay. I know. I'm going to. Where's Zoom? Zoom is here. Da da da. Yeah, I can do it. Uh, this one, right? Just let's do this one. You want to drive now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now I need. No, no, I'm sorry. File. File. I think it's file. New image. Yeah. Huh. Sorry, I'm not very good at this. Yeah, you want me to get you to the. Yeah. Which one do you want? The uh, S2. This one? No, that's the Julia. Is A cub? Is it? No, no, S2. Oh, there it is. S2 canonical, right? Yeah. Not torque. Mm -hmm. You have the iter, it's too high. But. Yeah. Okay, so this is a picture of the parameter space for parameter space S2. So notice that we, now we have two escape regions. There's an outer escape region, with, which is centered at the point at infinity, and inner escape region, which is centered at the origin. And let's see if we... Uh, If we click uh, in the inner escape region, we'll get a Philo Julia set, which looks like this with the, the, uh, the components of the Phil Julia set look much like disjoint round balls and most of them are very small. On the other hand, let's see, if I uh, click, That's good. You're good. Okay. If I click in the outer region, say here. No, you have to do it again because oh. you turned it off. Spawn. Up one. Up one. No. Here. Spawn. There you go. If we click in the outer region, say here. Then the Julia set is, familiar, is filled with figures of a familiar object, namely the basilica. And it's not only it looks like the basilica, it, it acts like a basilica too. So if I, if I uh, tr trace orbits starting at the critical point here, you get shoots back and forth, just like the, the quadratic basilica does. This set out here is a pre. Uh, let's get rid of this. This set out here is a pre-image of it. So if we start somewhere out here, we'll shoot down and eventually get 
get back to this. And all of these little sets are pre images. So if I click it in on any one of them, it'll eventually get back to the pre image. But if we click outside the uh, Phil Julia set, say if we click at a point like this, then the orbit will eventually shoot off to infinity. Well, that, those, that's the inside and the outside. Now, if we, this, for example, is a little copy of the Mandelbrot set. And if we click here, we get this figure, which, uh, well, that's what we get in any case. <laughs> but um, let me give some other examples. Oops. Oops. Mistake. Well, that's what you want. You have to grab the top. Oops. You want this one? You want that? No, you want to grab the top. That one? No, now we're lost. <laughs> yeah, just, just kill those. It's this one, I think. No, nope, not that one either. <laughs> we have too many windows. Okay, let me try. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see if we can find it. It's not this one, I think. Nope. I don't think it's this one. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. So, for example, here, this is a little copy of the Mandelbrot set, although it may not look like it. So here, since we're in S2, there should be a period two orbit. And it looks like we have a, well, let's just click and see what we're getting. If we click here, we get a period two orbit. If we click here, we find a fixed point. So this is the case where we have a period two orbit going back and forth and a fixed point here. Now we can compare that. Oops. Compare that, that was clicking here. If we click in this part of the Mandelbrot set, And we get a very symmetrical figure. So the, the two critical points do very much the same thing. One goes back and forth here and here. The other goes back and forth here and here. So we can, we'll have, uh, so we have this or this. And I think that's maybe enough of this, but uh, how am I doing for time? I've, I have... Well, okay, maybe I should try, try looking a little at S3 now. This is a, S3 is a more dramatic example. So we need to, uh, again, Uh, file, yeah. yeah, new image. Yes. What here, where it says Mandel complex, you pull that down and you should see S3 tour. Now, oh, here, and then way down. Yeah. So, yeah, this one, big, that's Julia. You want the one above it? Right there, yeah. 
and then you want to yeah okay so this will be a picture of the torus of course we can't fit the torus on a flat plane but we can fit its universal covering space on the plane so this will be the universal covering space of the torus and you remember that um, there were eight puncture points here, or correspondingly eight uh, escape regions. Well, since this is the universal covering space, things get copied several times. For example, this is, I think, the rabbit region, and it is isomorphic to this. It's, these two are identical. This, I think, is the complex conjugate rabbit. That is isomorphic to this. But there are eight essentially different regions. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And well, I've said this was the rabbit region. Let's check if it's true. If we... Oops. Oops. Doesn't seem very this one. Bad window. I'm very confused. So let's see. Where... Maybe try it closer to the edge. See, let's see. Yeah, I think you're okay on spawn. Yeah. You're fine there. Don't select anything. Just that'll turn it off. Okay. So just click. Yeah, try that. Yeah. So you've got pictures of the. Is this a rabbit or a co-rabbit? I think it's a co-rabbit. So let's uh, let's check by yeah, those are trace. Okay, if we click say at the center point, then we get a get a picture just like the uh, the uh, complex conjugate of the duadi rabbit. Let's see, are there more, more things we can look for here? So just X, just get rid of some of these windows. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, that was a mistake. Uh, so that's the ra co-rabbit region, the rabbit region. This, I think, is the airplane region. Go near the edge. Oh, okay. So, so you're way like A and, a and yeah. C or 100. Yeah. So I go somewhere in here. Yeah. And we see a sort of copy of the airplane here, another copy up here, and so on. Okay, I better get back to my talk now. So, does he have to stop sharing or can you just take it? Okay, so we need to pull this up. We need to go into your Zoom. Where's your Zoom? Uh, I have to find your Zoom. I'm sorry. Uh, stop share here. And then you want your talk. Is this still alive? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, but now he can't see his screen. <laughs> so you have to share something. Because, oh shit, now we have this problem again. Okay, is this working? You're not sharing. Okay, now this is, uh, I want to talk about our next important topic, external rays. There are external rays in the field, for the Phil Julia set, there are field, external rays for the connectedness locus. But first, suppose that we stick to take a cubic polynomial which belongs to the connectedness locus. Then I've said that the complement of 
the field Julia said is isomorphic to the complement of the closed unit disk. But this is, uh, there's more to say than this. Not only are they diffeomorphic, but they share the same dynamics. So if you look at the map F in the complement of the field Julia said, it looks just like the, uh, corresponds exactly to the cu cubing map, F maps to F cubed in the complement of the closed unit disk. So suppose we look again at this example, which, we, which is a cubic Julia set, which is more or less symmetric. Now, here I've drawn the, uh, the rays which map to themselves under, uh, which have period two rather under tripling. So the one eighth ray maps to the three eighths ray and the three eighth ray maps to the nine eighths ray, which is the same as the one eighth ray. So this corresponding ray here maps to this one, this maps back to this one. And similarly, the quarter ray maps to the three quarters ray back to the one quarter ray. So these two rays get interchanged. What this means essentially is that if we look just near this point, things essentially get rotated 180 degrees. So this will map over to this, this, this will map over to this and so on. And this uh, seventh eighths ray maps over to the five eighths ray. So this point maps over to this, back to this. Now we can formalize it, this by making a following definition. If we pick a period Q, then the period Q orbit portrait for a cubic map is an equivalence relation between angles of period Q under angle tripling. We say that two angles are equivalent if and only if the corresponding rays land at the same point. So in this example, we have three different rays which land at the same point. So the, these, these three angles are equivalent, two eighths, one quarter, three eighths, and three quarters. And we do indicate this by making a little diagram, which is more or less a copy of this, where, where this circle represents the circle at infinity out in this picture, and the uh, rays correspond to rays. So the 5 8 ray doesn't, nothing else lands there, so we don't make any special marking there from the 7th ray, 8th ray also. And as I said before, we have 1 8 corresponding to 3 8 one fourth corresponding to three fourths and so on. So this is a, a simple example of an orbit portrait associated with a Julia set. Now, much of what I've said up to now would work equally well in any degree, but this is a special, very special feature of cubic maps that every critical point has a corresponding co-critical point. And we can see it easily if we look at the real graph of a cubic map. So here I've, we have two critical points, but I choose coordinates so that their average is zero. So that one of the, if one of them is A, the other is minus A. And then the points 2A and minus 2A play a very special role, which you see from this graph f of a is the same as f of minus 2a. And similarly here, f of minus a is the same as f of 2a. So uh, this may look like a special feature of this graph, but it's true for any cubic map over the real or complex numbers. And here's an example. This is a uh, well, this is an example in the, uh, where we of of a in S two in a region where we have copies of the basilica. So we have a critical point A, marked critical point, which maps back and forth to uh, its its image, and then we have a free critical point whose orbit escapes to infinity, and it's convenient to draw a figure eight curve consisting of all points which 
which shoot off to infinity at the at the same speed where this has a precise technical definition. So everything on the figure eight shoots off to infinity every outside, everything outside the figure eight shoots off to infinity even faster. And the whole field Julia said is contained inside the figure eight. Some parts are in the big lobe and some parts are in the little lobe. Now, we, so this is the co-critical point, the point which has the same image as, as minus A. So it's convenient to look at the, at the external ray, which, which uh, passes through this point. And if we take theta plus a third or a theta minus one third, they have the same image under tripling. So that means that they will both land at the point at the co critical at the critical point minus a the free critical point so we we could try to label things by the we what we're really interested in is the rays which land at the critical point but there are two of them and it makes more sense to label things by the co critical angle which is uniquely determined So we say in this case that the map F lies on a parameter ray of co-critical angle theta if, oh uh, yeah, co-critical angle. And we're especially interested in the case where one of these rays is uh, periodic. So if we uh, say it has period P, then if we map, have mapped forward p times, all three of these rays will map to one of them, say to this one. But the we label things not by the periodic angle, but the coperiodic angle. This picture is interesting for another reason. Notice that I've also drawn in the uh, rays of angle 0, 1 eighth, uh, 1 quarter, 3 eighths, one half, uh, five eighths, three quarters, and seven eighths. We see that there's a well defined uh, orbit portrait. The one quarter ray, the three quarters ray, the five eighths, and the seven eighths rays all land at the same point. So the concept of orbit portrait still makes sense, even though we're in the escape locus. Okay. So this makes just leads us to the following definition. For any period Q and any period P where they're both at least one, we can look at period Q orbits in SP. So we know that the Marked critical point will always have period P, but we're looking at points of some period Q, which may be different from P. And this is an illustration for the case Q equals P equals two. So we have two rays here, a co-period two, two rays here, and the rest are all in the middle. And I've blown this up so that you can see them more clearly. So there are 12 rays of co-period two in here and uh, eight plus two plus two makes 12 outside. And you might wonder why, why do they have denominator 24? Well, remember co-period means that the angle plus or minus a third has to be periodic. So for example, if we take 16 24 and subtract uh, eight 24 which is one third, and we'll get six, six twenty-fourths, which is one eighth. So this this is the one where the one eighth ray is is periodic. And so so the, we, this divides the space up into a number of uh, faces. The next slide shows shows these 
eight faces, many faces. So there, there are 12 rays inside and 12 rays outside and a number of faces. And you see that there are many different possible orbit portraits. <clears throat> In fact, there are almost all but one of the possible period two orbit portraits are shown here. For example, we can have just five eighths and seven eighths joined or just one eighth and three eighths. We can have both or we can have this figure or the complex conjugate figure. We can have this figure or its complex conjugate figure, which I guess is that one or similar figures here and here. You might think you, you could have an orbit where only these two are joined, but remember that uh, one quarter maps to three quarters. So this curve maps to this curve. You can't, you can't have this one without this one. That's different from this situation where each of these is a, is a represent, lands at a fixed point so that you can have only one of them. But here, one of these implies the other. Now, here's a basic theorem. Two maps which are in the same phase of this tessellation always have the same well-defined orbit of period Q. Remember, we're outside the connectedness locus here, but still it's well-defined. And there seems to be a further statement that faces with an edge in common always have different orbit portraits. So when we cross an edge, it essentially always uh, changes the orbit portrait. But that, uh, that's an empirical statement. We, we believe it, but don't have a proof in general. Oh, but before I, I should check this, if we go back here. So for example, here we have an orbit portrait. And if we cross an edge, we get a smaller orbit portrait. Or if we cross this edge, we get a different smaller orbit portrait. Or if we cross this edge, we get a different, orbit, more complicated orbit portrait. But every time we cross an edge, something changes. Now, notice that we have to cross an edge. If we cross through a vertex, we could cross from here to here through this vertex, we would get the same orbit portrait. So it's important that we only allow crossing an edge. Or similarly here, we could cross through, through the point and get to here with the same orbit portrait. Okay, that was the, that was the case with the S2. If we go to S3, things get much more complicated as you see there are many, many more uh, even even for the period two in, in S3, there are many more things to consider. Well, there are still only 12 in each face, but there are more faces. So each face has 12 edges, but we get this more complicated picture. And we can... Well, let me explain. Uh, it would be too complicated to try to show what's going on everywhere here, but it, we're just picking out the little region in the upper right here and showing the uh, corresponding orbit portraits. So, well, first I said roughly that crossing an edge always changes the orbit portrait. Now there, that isn't true. Sometimes we have an edge like this, which ends at a dead end. In that case, the two sides are the same. So if we cross this edge, we cross from a face to itself, but that's the exception. If we cross from a face to a different face, then the orbit portrait seems to change. Now I said that we saw almost all possible orbit portraits of period two in the S2, but there's one exception. Here we have a region where the orbit portrait is empty. No two rays land, no two rays of period two land at the same point. Again, we see we can have two different regions here and here with the same orbit portrait of period two and so on. And if we uh, 
if we went through the whole thing, we'd see find all possible period to orbit portraits. Okay, well, I think I've tired you enough with these descriptions. Thank you very much for your attention. And wonderful 60th anniversary. And for any of you who are interested in studying further, here are some, some uh, references for further work. But thank you very much. Muchas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Miller, for this nice talk. I am sure that your talk will inspire to our students and research to study deeply this kind of problems. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, some questions? Preguntas de algunos de los que están este, eh, de los que están eh, viendo este vieron esta plática? ¿Hay alguna pregunta? Oh, sí, aquí hay en el chat. Ajá. Pregunta Why no quadratic term in the map? Why is there no quadratic term? Well, okay, the normal form for a polynomial of degree D, you can, you, you have a, a two parameter family of affine transformations that you can change it by. And the first thing you can do is change it so that the leading coefficient is plus one. But that's called making it a monic polynomial. And that still gives you one degree of freedom, so you can use that to change the, the next highest coefficient equal to zero. That's called centering the polynomial because it has the effect that uh, things will be, this, will, this is more or less the center of gravity of the field Julius that things are arranged around this center. And this, this in the particular cubic case, this means that you don't have a degree two term. If we're looking at degree 15, we'd get rid of the degree 14 terms. Okay. Otra cosa, Paz quiere hacer una pregunta. Paz. Paz, adelante, abre tu micrófono. ¿Me oyen? Sí. Actually, I just wanted to thank you, Jack and Paz Álvarez. Thank you for a beautiful, beautiful talk. And it's so great to see you. Es todo, gracias. Adán también quiere hacer una pregunta. Adán. Adelante, Adán, abre tu micrófono. Javier Gómez Monte. No, no hay pregunta de Adán. Uh, uh, I have a question. Adelante. Uh, so, uh, polynomials of degree D, D may be embedded into polynomials of degree 2D or 3D by iteration. Does, yes. Does, does this complicate the, uh, very much the picture? Because, you know, this, let's say for, for quadratics, a uh, Mandelbrot set will be embedded in all, all in, in many dimensions. So, exactly. Uh, yes. Does this complicate the picture very much? Well, the, the picture. So if you if you replace f by f composed with itself, so you're passing from degree two to four. The space of fourth degree polynomials is an enormous object. The the things you get from degree two are a very small part of it. So I. I I think I I wouldn't think this is much of a complication. The, the fourth degree polynomials are complicated by themselves, and this is a very small part of it that we understand well. Okay. Okay. Or or another another question is is it, the external rays are obtained by uniformizing the complement of the. Of, of, of the Mandelbrot set, 
is and, and then in 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 this multidimensional case where the parameter space is bigger than dimension one, is there something similar multidimensional to external rays? Well, um, well the. Uh, well, I guess the, the 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 easiest case would be cubic maps, where this was studied very much by <clears throat> Otto Brenner and John Hamel Hubbard many years ago. I think the uh, the analog of external rays, or what they call stretching rays, roughly speaking, if you uh, if you start with a given picture, you can make a quasi-conformal change of variable, which uh, doesn't doesn't affect the topological dynamics, but which changes the uh, rate of escape. And but the, the but um, so roughly speaking, in, in in higher dimensions, the equipotentials, the things which escape escape to infinity at a given rate, form form a smooth hypersurface. And the uh, your orthogonal trajectories are, are curves, which you could call external rays. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, I, uh, there is a question by Hugo Hernandez. In real quadratic maps, the run, the run normalization group played a role to obtain universal properties. Could have a role in this kind of maps? Thanks a lot. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I didn't quite understand the question. Well, I will read it. I will read it again. In real quadratic maps, the run, the run normalization group played a role to obtain universal properties. Could have a role in this kind of maps. Like the normalization. Yes, I'm sure that renormalization is a, a very important topic. Uh, um, but I, I, I don't know quite how to answer the question, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Adam, Adam uh, wants to make a question. Adelante, Adam. Uh, gracias. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, you mentioned the genus of the uh, Riemann surfaces SP grows very rapidly. And I was wondering if there is a closed formula for such a genus. A closed formula uh, for, for the genus. Uh, yeah, the SP surfaces. Yeah, yes, the, the uh, yes, it, it's a simple closed formula. Uh, the, the, the difficult thing to count is the number of, of uh, of uh, puncture points that it's it's a difficult computation and it's been carried out for up to 30 or so but after that it's not known but for the the genus there's a, a simple formula there's uh it roughly grows like uh like three to the p and uh, okay mm -hmm. thank you very much mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have a question. Yes, the, the software that you use in this presentation is open or there is a way to, to, to get it? D-tool. D-tool. Oh, D-tool, yes. That, that's... Um, it's free. It's a free program. Uh, let's see, it's available. What is it? SourceForge? SourceForge. It's called uh, Dynamics Explorer. Dy yeah, Dynamics Explorer. I think you should be able to locate it on the uh, on the internet. Dynamics Explorer, SourceForge, uh, Susan and Brian Boyd. Well, there are three more questions, Professor Milner. One is very, uh, the Jaciel Navarro, 
He says, this may be a personal question. In your opinion, what's the work of a mathematician? What is the work of a mathematician? Yes. <laughs> well, work, well, there are many, many things that a mathematician has to do, exploring the unknown. Uh, it's a cooperative enter enterprise, an international enterprise, so we, uh, we take ideas from many countries and we hope that the ideas will, will spread to many countries. Uh, in this, so in this particular case, uh, holomorphic dynamics, the beginnings were in France, but, uh, but uh, people in many, many other countries contributed and uh, I think of mathematics as a wonderful collaborative effort from people all over the, over the world, which who can agree on the rules of what is true and what isn't and, uh, and cooperate in, in, in making progress and understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very nice, very great answer. Uh, there's another question by Emma, Emma Turrubiates. Hello, Professor Midner. Do you have any advice for young mathematician, for young mathematics students? Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a hard question. Uh, the mathematics keeps changing so that um, well, you have to, one, one has to make a compromise, not, not specializing too much, but not, uh, not generalizing too much also. I mean, many important advances in mathematics come from combining ideas from different fields. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very good to have multiple points of view to learn from different things. But of course, if you try to learn everything, you end up learning nothing. It's it's also necessary to specialize. It's a delicate question. Okay. Thank you, Professor. There's a last question. Adan wants to make a last question. Adelante, Adan. Hi, uh, just one more. Thank you. One more question. Uh, since this talk is regarding cubic polynomials, I was wondering that if there's any relation to the space of uh, configuration spaces, in this case, uh, per se, three points in the plane, since it seems that we are characterizing these Julia sets and et cetera, by looking at conditions on the roots, in this case, it being the iterability, as in or uh, critical points having order P, et cetera. So maybe looking at these polynomials from the point of view of the roots and therefore from the point of view of configuration spaces, does this provide another insight into solving this problem? Well, I, I think this, this illustrates what I was just saying. It, it, progress also often comes from combining several different points of view. So this is certainly a very valid alternative point of view. Uh, I would... Uh, I, I think uh, it's amazing the number of different things which which come to work. I mean, kind of, for example, ergodic theory is very very important in in, in uh, understanding dynamics. But this this is something which arose from Claude Shannon, an electrical engineer who was interested in communication, and it was passed by him to Kolmogorov in Russia, who developed it as, as a pure mathematical theory, and it is next, next spread, now spread to many parts of mathematics. It's, uh, it's good to, to have different points of view and different versions of the question. OK, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. There are no more questions. I don't know if you have another question, another last question, with Manuel. No, for me it's okay. Okay. Well, there are no more questions. So 
Professor Minor, we want to thank you a lot for this very nice talk. I guess this will be an inspiration for our students. And before we end, we, I want to read your uh, recognition, some kind of diploma. Please, uh, Eric, I want to, I want to thank you. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to read it. It is in Spanish, but I want to read it. It reads National Polytechnic Institute, um, High School Studies of Physics and Mathematics. It uh, grants this uh, recognition to Professor John Milner for the presentation of the Vidia, Vidia Conference, Cubic Polynomial Maps, as part of the 26th uh, meeting, national meeting, uh, academic national meeting of physics and mathematics, and within the uh, professorship, Eugenio Mendez de Curro, to 2021. Uh, Mexico City, August 25th to 2021, and uh, the technique to the service of the fatherland, and I sign it as the director of the physics and mathematics school at the Polytechnic Institute. Professor Milner, mm -hmm. it was a very nice and very pleased, we're very pleased that you have participated in our event and the, to give this opening a majestic conference. Thank you, thank you very much. I don't want if you want to say some words. Well, first of all, I, 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 as you see, there was a great deal of confusion during the course of this talk, and I want to help. Uh, I want to thank the two people who, who got me through it: Scott Sutherland and Araceli Bonifant. Yes. Uh, and uh, well, it's been a great pleasure, and I certainly enjoyed getting in some contact with Mexico again. It's been a long time. Yes. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot to you, Professor. We will we will send it to you uh, virtually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Recognition, but uh, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll send you some presents by mail. Uh, thank you. Just for for participating in our event. I hope you will receive them in the next uh, days. Thanks a thank lot. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Well, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Hasta luego, Hasta luego. Bye. Gracias, Araceli. Gracias. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. If you want to show yourself. Oh, me? Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank